Well, hey, so how much longer until Brian gets back? Two weeks. Two that's weeks. what I was told this week. Okay. Well, hey, for First News, I'm Micah. I'm Chris. And we have an exciting week. We, we've already had a couple of exciting weeks at our church. Uh, we've had Noah's Ark. We've had the Christmas Craft Fair. And it's not over yet. We have um, one thing that's really neat that we do for our community with the live nativity. Oh, yeah. We're looking for people. Yes, we are. And you can sign up for that to be a cast member or... Uh, help out in another way uh, down by the elevators. Yes, yeah, they've got a table, so if you want to play a role in that, a shepherd, uh, a wise man, Mary Joseph, mm -hmm. whatever, or if you don't, they've got other spots that they're looking for people to help with. That's right. Um, also coming up is our agape meal. Okay, now listen. Listen, everybody focus. Everybody, hello. Okay, we're changing the schedule for that morning. 9.30, we have Bible study. At 1045, we will have one combined service, okay? 930 Bible study, 1045 combined service, and it'll be Brian's first Sunday back. Oh, of course. He comes back when we're having food. You know, he, well, he's Baptist. So, you know, it would be fun. He always says we sit in the same spot. Move around. Let's confuse him. Jumble it up a little yeah. bit. So, also, also he, I saw a bunch of envelopes on the did wall. Did you? You saw those? Yeah. Yes. Those are our missions offering. Um, oh. I probably should put them back. You took them off? I didn't know what they were for. They're for the missions offering. They had a bunch of numbers on them. Yes, the numbers represent the dollars, how much you put in there. You took them off? So if I take 50, I'm going to get $50. Yeah, how many did you take off? I'll be right back. Oh, you are broke. Well, hey, while he fixes that, that is out in the foyer. Hope you can give to missions offering. For First News, I'm Micah, and Chris just went bankrupt. Wow, we reached offering in the first week that we have it up, so that's great. Hello and welcome, First Family. We are glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. If you are a guest, if you would please fill out the guest reservation card found in the pew in front of you. You can either put it in the offering plate or go to the Welcome Center by the preschool for a, for a uh, gift that we have for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for for this day that you have blessed us with. And Father, as we make a joyful noise, let our worship be pleasing to you. Be with Johnny today as he preaches your word and just give him boldness and confidence. And we pray this in your name, amen. <laughs> Worship, would you stand with us as we sing about the mercy of our God? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Sins, they are many as mercy. 
here this morning. The word of the Lord from Paul in Philippians. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external, external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God also exalted him highly and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. May the Lord add his blessing to this word this morning as we affirm our faith once again by singing together, is he worthy? Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do.
morning church family. Have you noticed the harvest is ripe? Jesus is Lord, but not everybody knows him. The world needs Jesus. And God doesn't need you, but he wants you to have a part in it. So I want to encourage you this morning before you go to Sunday school to go out to our area near the coffee center and pick up a missions offering envelope. Every bit out of our abundance helps. Everyone needs Jesus. And we can share God's love with Corpus Christi and the world. Will you pray with me? Good morning, Abba Father. Jesus is Lord. Father God, you are a creator. And you sent your son, Jesus, to be our redeemer. Father, your word says that you own the cattle on a thousand hills and that every good gift comes from you. So, Father, this morning, please accept these thy gifts as we bring them to your table. Father God, remind us to have open hearts and open hands as we share your love with the world. Oh, Father, the world needs your son so much. So take these gifts this morning and take our lives and our talents as well and use them to further your kingdom and to share your son with Corpus Christi and with the world around us. It's in your precious son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Oh, 
to thank Brian for allowing me to uh, have this time with you this morning, just to share a little bit in who we are in Christ and kingdom living. A couple of announcements before that. Sometimes the, the preacher has to do this. First of all, the bell tower dedication is this afternoon at three o'clock. We're looking for that to la last about an hour with the concert and the worship beforehand. So it'll be a, uh, not a long commitment, but we hope that you'll come and enjoy the bells, but also enjoy the time that we spend thanking God for the gift of that tower uh, for those bells. Um, also, I just want to um, let you know about Steve Fant passing away um, yesterday morning. Uh, Steve has been helping for the last few years with our sound in our stream and in our broadcast, and uh, just a delightful uh, man, and um, very quick, just about 10 or 11 days after he began to show some uh, signs of sickness, uh, different things in his body weren't working quite right. So uh, if you'll be in prayer for Mary Kay and Dennis and Elizabeth, the family, um, as they make preparations, but also um, I just want to pray for them before we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Steve, his commitment to you. We're so thankful that uh, he was able to help out in so many ways here at the church, and also the way he uh, was able to be a part of his family, leading them and helping them to know the hand of Christ. We just pray for Mary Kay and for Dennis and Elizabeth and all the others that are involved. We just ask, Lord, that you would be very near and dear to them, and we are thankful that Steve is with you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So what does it mean to be uh, a person who lives uh, in the kingdom? in the kingdom of God. Uh, I titled this Kingdom Living, and the subtitle is, it may be a little different than you think, okay? Um, now, if you studied uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament closely, it may be exactly as you think it's going to be. But you do need to do some studying before you decide what kingdom living is all about. We use the word life and the word living in so many different strange ways in our uh, in our. Uh, community and our faith and our uh, in our world one of which is doesn't make much sense to me if somebody asks about your work you say it's a living well is that all there is to living is just work maybe maybe for some some people derogatorily will say things like uh, i have a friend and i call him up on the phone and i say how's how are things today and he always says the same thing living the dream and uh <laughs> Of course, we know that he doesn't mean that exactly the way it sounds. Uh, but also the word life, we, we sometimes derogatorily say to people, get a life, uh, which is not very nice, really. They have a life. You may not agree with the way they're living it, but, uh, and then sometimes we use this phrase over and over again, it's my life and I'll do what I want. Um, I, I really want to challenge that this morning because is it really our life? I'm not sure that it is. Um, so whose life is it? First point in my sermon this morning is living free. Uh, this was a little bit hard to term because really in the kingdom of God, things are kind of turned upside down most of the time. Um, those, those who are exalted will be exalted. Those, uh, those who are not exalted will be exalted, and then vice versa. Uh, those who are first are going to be last, and the last are going to be first. So in the kingdom of God, everything's a little bit on its head, just a little bit. So we kind of have to think about this from the standpoint of, if we're going to live free, my point is, that means living in Christ. And that's where we're going to end up. So why don't we live free? I think there's lots of different an answers. But the world standard says, we are responsible for our own lives. It's all on me, okay? It's all on me. We hear that all the time. And it's all about me. Um, but there's way more to this when we consider Jesus Christ and the gift that he gave to us. We can't stop there because actually that's not a very good place to start with me. And I'm also pretty sure that if God created everything, he created me uh, with all my difficulties and flaws as well, although he would let, rather that I live for him. So I'm pretty sure it isn't me that's the main thing here. And I really couldn't create myself on my own anyway. And if I did, what would that look like? Uh, not very good. Not very good at all. 
So, as we consider this today, once again, the first or last, the last or first, those that have been exalted are not going to be exalted anymore. And those who have been at the very lowest rung are the ones that are going to be exalted in the kingdom of God. In 1 John 3, 1, we read these words. See what great love the Father has lavished on that. We sang that in the first song this morning, by the way, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Just says it right out. That is what we are, the children of God. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now, that's a little hard to unpack, I think, because um, the terminology there is a little bit hard to figure out. But as you know from the New Testament, there were many times that individuals, disciples, others didn't really understand who Jesus was. And he would have to explain, sometimes in vain, because they weren't really listening. Okay, But it says the same thing about us whenever we live in Christ. The world doesn't really understand us, doesn't know us, until they partake of the heavenly gift, and they have light from Jesus Christ. So in this first part, we need to realize that God's nature is always good, and he stays true to his nature. At every course, at every turn, read your Old Testament, he stays true to his nature. Now, there are times when, because he was good, he had to act in a very violent way, because God can't exist with evil at the same time. So there were times when he exerted his authority. But for the most part, we only see the good in God, making a way for us. And of course, in Christ we do. And so he's always true to the na his nature, and he loves his creation, and that's us. So at the very root of things, we are God's. I'm not my own. I'm God's. It's a very... Good idea for me to include God in every aspect. And it's kind of funny that I put it that way, because really God's involved anyway. He's, he's intensely involved in me, okay? And so when I say allow him, I don't know that I do much of that, but it is good for me to give over my will to his will and allow him to be in, involved in every aspect of my life, whether that's relationships, decisions, or especially my character. And we're going to talk about that in the third point this morning, about what our character is in Christ. So maybe we should just act like an heir to the kingdom of God that we really are, like a child of the king, and truly live free. Some people might think that that sounds odd, because really, if I'm going to live in Christ, I have to be obedient as much as possible, I'm human, so I'm going to fail. But as much as possible, I need to be obedient to Christ. So that sounds like I'm, I'm not exactly free. But try it. <laughs> try obedience. It's very freeing. Because then we see things more from Christ's perspective. Uh, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, so the second point is living redeemed. Because we have been redeemed if we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. But we kind of need to live that way. And sometimes I think that we think of salvation as a point and not a process. And so sometimes we think, well, I'm saved. Done. Check that off. But we're not done. We're not done until we get to heaven. And, and even then, I think we're going to have things to do. Praising God. Uh, being with his people. So Christ made a way, and a new light has dawned for humanity in Christ. So let's look back at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says these words, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, flesh and bone. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him to the highest place 
and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in Philippians, we find that there's a gift that's been given to us through Jesus Christ. And many of us know this every day of our life. We feel it. But I want to encourage you to live it. I need to be encouraged to live it every day. And I'm not talking about just the benefits. I'm talking about the hard parts. When I walk from one place to another, I see someone that's hurting. It's time for me to act as a redeemed person. Um, And that's a part of who we are as Christians. So it's a gift, and why would I really refuse this gift that's been offered to me? Acceptance leads to obedience, so God becomes the great author and sustainer of our faith. This is not easy. Every day I get up, most days I fail in one way or another. (laughs) Most days I ignore the needs that are there because I get too busy with my agenda. When I make God's agenda, my agenda, then things begin to fall into place much better. And our nature, when we really truly put our trust in Jesus Christ, changes. We talked about transformation earlier. So our nature changes from me, which is selfish, selfishness, to selflessness. Um, Which brings me to my last point. I know you think I'm done early, but I'm not done early. Um, My last point is living for Christ, living for Jesus. And I just want to read you the words of that song that we sang a few minutes ago, because I really can't find much better than this um, to tell us what what it is. Now, the word of God is never going to usurp. I mean, uh, the the hymns are never going to usurp the word of God. I always want to go back to the Word of God, but listen to the Word of God breathed from this hymn. It says, living for Jesus, a life that is true. We just read part of that, by the way. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Living for Jesus who died in my place. There's the atonement. Bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me, constrains me. It grabs me at my very core to answer his call, follow his leading, and give him my all. Living through, for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of his smile. Seeking the lost ones, he died to redeem, bringing the weary to find rest in him. We're going to talk about that in a minute again, too. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Like I say, songs don't take the place of Scripture, but there's so much Scripture packed into that song. It's, it's, it's worth our hearing this morning. So how do we live for Jesus? Let's continue in Philippians chapter 2. Turn over to verse 16 now, and let's find out what it means to truly live for Christ, to live uh, in the kingdom, even here on earth. Philippians 2.12 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Please underline those words. It's not a point, it's a process. And if we think we've just arrived when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, then we're going to miss some things, some good things, about how God can bring even more into our life, more of that abundance that he talked about from his word, 
from these songs, from worship, from relationships and Bible study with others. We need to live in the fact that he's, he's given us more than, than just a day that we gave our heart to Jesus Christ. He's given us something that is continually worked out, according to Paul here. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. That's as succinct a way of putting the Christian life as anything. Christ working in and through us to help others. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Oops, that was the hard part, wasn't it? Because we are Baptist, right? Yeah. I've been a Baptist for a very long time. In fact, I've been a, a Baptist um, this year, uh, 51 years. Um, of course, I'm a, I was a Baptist before I was a Baptist. You know what I mean? Uh, I was, I've been a Christian for 51 years. I've been a Baptist since I was probably not born. So um, that part about is really tough about not grumbling or arguing. And I think what it's talking about mostly is sometimes we do have to work out difficulties in the body of Christ. But if the arguing and the grumbling becomes the main thing, we've really lost sight of why we're here. So it says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. So the mark of someone who's not an arguer or a grumbler is they're working towards blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And that, this is my favorite part. Because then you will shine among them, the world, like stars in the sky, bringing light as you hold firmly to the word of life. Folks, this is the Christian life. And it's all through the New Testament. And really and truly, it's all through the Old Testament in many different ways as well. We're going to look at that in just a second. I've got to hurry, of course. These are very challenging words that Paul gives us. Do I really live in Christ? Mm, sometimes. Sometimes I don't measure up, though, most days. I can hear myself over these last 35-plus years on youth choir tours and mission trips and presentations and mission efforts and food pantry and street ministry and Faith City Mission and all the things that we've done. I can hear myself telling teams over and over again, it's not about us, live as Christ. But I don't, I'm not sure I really understood how important those words were 30 years ago. They're even more important today because we live in a generation that thinks mainly of itself, okay? We just do, and it's probably more than one generation, just to be quite honest. Several generations have thought mainly about themselves. So breaking this chain of things is going to take some work, and it's going to have to happen from the standpoint of Christians who decide to do what God has called us to do. So the choir sang this song, Compassion Him. Keith and Kristen Getty and Stuart Townend wrote this song, um, I think about 13 years ago. And uh, we, we sang it a few years back. I'm not sure what year. Um, and then I brought it back this year, and it just has really impacted my life in so many different ways. And once again, I believe hymns and songs are inspired by Scripture and by God. Uh, but gathered here in this one song are prophecies about the life of Christ, the life of Christ, and many other scriptures come together uh, to see this transformation to become a child of the king. So let me just read this and unpack each stanza really quickly before we close. It says, there is an everlasting kindness you lavished on us. There's that image of lavishing. God lavishing grace, kindness, and love upon, upon us. Um, these images, I read 1 John 3 earlier. That's lavishing love upon us. And Ephesians 1 talks about lavished grace. So there is this everlasting kindness that God has lavished on us. 
when the radiance of heaven came to rescue the lost. You called the sheep without a shepherd to leave their distress for your streams of forgiveness and the shade of your rest. All of a sudden, the shepherd's psalm just bursts into the scene on this stanza, showing how God is continually taking care of his people and teaching us how to live more like Christ. The second stanza says, and with compassion for the hurting, you reached out your hand as the lame ran to meet you and the dead breathed again. You saw behind the eyes of sorrow and shared in our tears. Heard the sigh of the weary, let the children draw near. So much packed into the stanza, it's kind of overwhelming. Signs and wonders, miracles by Christ, healings are here. Um, the story we had a few weeks ago about the woman at the well, you saw behind the eyes of sorrow. Jesus saw right to her soul. Maybe these is kind of an amalgamation of Isaiah 35, which is a prophecy of the things that Jesus was going to be doing. But then the last line, heard the sigh of the weary, and then all of a sudden Matthew 19 just gets thrown in here. Let the children draw near. Showing another aspect of God's willingness to be on the same level as anyone at any time. Whether it's in the worst situation or the best situation, God is ready to meet it. If you're the lowest, if you're a small child, if you're the poorest, or if you're the richest, or if you're the eldest, God's still ready to meet you at every one of those opportunities. It's just a beautiful, beautiful expression. But it doesn't stop there, because in verse 3, we all of a sudden are transported straight to the foot of the cross. We stood beneath the cross of Calvary and gazed on your face at the thorns of oppression and the wounds of disgrace. For surely you have borne our suffering and carried our grief as you pardoned the scoffer and showed grace to the thief. God, yet man, dying on a cross, still showing forth the very nature of God in pardoning, in giving grace, in taking on all that we were owed. It's just a beautiful scene. Fourth stanza wraps it up like this. How beautiful the feet that carry this gospel of peace. Now that's a, that's a comment from Isaiah 52, but also used in Romans 10. And if you have a week or so, spend it in Romans 10, because there's a lot there. Um, but it says, how beautiful the feet that carry this gospel of peace. To the fields of injustice and the valleys of need, to be a voice of hope and healing, to answer the cries of the hungry and helpless with the mercy of Christ. I can think of no greater calling for anyone, for anyone than to do exactly what Jesus Christ has asked us to do. Now, that call comes to all of us differently. Not all of us are called to do the same things. Um, some are called to preach. Thank goodness I wasn't. I'm here this morning uh, because of the need and the fact that occasionally I feel like the Lord's given me something to say. Some are called to sing. Some are called to teach. Some are called to go out and to continually tell people about Jesus Christ. Some are called to go halfway around the world or just across town to be a missionary. But make no mistake if you are dead sinner in the calling that God has given to you and you are proclaiming Christ in, that, in and through that calling, that's the highest. That's the highest because that's what obedience is and that's what these, these verses are talking about. To be a voice of hope and healing and to answer the cries of the hungry and helpless with the mercy of Christ. And that's what those words from Isaiah are about. How beautiful the feet that carry the gospel of peace. 
The refrain is, what boundless love, what fathomless grace you have shown us, O God of compassion. Each day we live an offering of praise as we show to the world your compassion. We know in our lives as Christians that the love and the grace of Jesus Christ is amazing. It's hard to fathom. It's, it's, it's so boundless that we don't even know how to talk about it properly sometimes. Because in my life, there have been many times when I thought, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> and all of a sudden, God makes it work. God makes that situation, that relationship, that job, that task, that ministry work. So God's boundless love, God's fathomless grace is always with us. But it says that each day we live should be an offering of praise because we're doing exactly what Christ did. Christ showed to the world compassion. When we do that, we not only honor Christ, but we make our lives an offering of praise to all that will hear and enjoy the message that we've been given through Jesus Christ. So, shouldn't we just live as a child of the King? It comes with responsibility, though, because if we act in ways that are contrary to the ways that Jesus act, uh, acts, we should be reprimanded. We should be corrected. We should be enlightened, maybe, in the right way to act. But when we do obey and we do share Christ with others in this compassionate way, we glorify God to the highest place again. And he allows us to be a part of his redemptive work in people's lives. You realize that Jesus did it all. But there are times when God allows us to share the light with others. I can think of no higher honor than to be able to do that in any situation. So my challenge today is this. Live as a child of the king. It isn't easy, but it's worth it all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we could be with you this morning. And we could share in this message of trying to live for you. Help us, Lord, to um, understand that obedience to the Father is not something that uh, is uh, derogatory or bad in our life. It's the perfect thing for us as a child of the King. So help us to, this morning, make a commitment anew to live for you, to serve you, and above all, to be obedient to the call that you've placed in our lives. The call not, not just to salvation, but the call to work out that salvation through ministry to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ask that you would stand with us this morning as we sing uh, a beautiful song of invitation. Um, and there'll be, uh, Chris is here, uh, Steve's here at the front. If you have some decision or you just like to pray this morning, if you haven't made it to that first step of knowing and experiencing the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, this is your day. Come and do that today. If maybe you haven't figured out what God is calling you to do yet, maybe this is the day. So pray about that as we sing almost home. Sing with us. Don't drop a single anchor, we're almost home. Through every toil or danger, we're almost home. 
How many pilgrim saints have before us gone? No stopping now, we're almost home. That promised land is calling, we're almost home. And not a tear shall fall then, we're almost home. Make ready now your souls for the kingdom come. Those turning back, we're almost home. is just a vapor we're almost home that sun is setting yonder we're almost home take courage for this darkness shall break to dawn open your eyes we're almost That blessed shore, oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. So the only admonition I have for you as you go this morning is to live as children of the King. As we sing together, he will hold me fast.